There's a couple of things before I start. Um, what you'll be pleased to know is I'm not going to give you half a dozen slides on Siemens um, because that annoys me when I attend uh, lectures. Uh, all I will say is that uh, we're about 87 billion order intake this year. Uh, we're amongst the, the world's leading uh, design innovation companies. We spend just shy of about 4 billion euros per year in research and development. I've had the great pleasure of being with the company for 20 years. As Richard said, both in our communications, our IT division, and for the last decade or more in our transmission and distribution division. So my perspective this evening uh, is, is internationally based, but I've obviously narrowed in to talk about the challenges in the UK electrical uh, infrastructure and, and sector. Uh, the nice thing about strategy is no one can be right or wrong. It's just a perspective. I will share with you my perspectives and those of Siemens. Um, what I can say is that uh, we've been around for 170 years. Now, that's not a boast. Uh, that's the fact that those who get the perspective closer to reality over the next 50 years will still be here. Those that get it sadly wrong, and there are many brand names, if you look back in history, that have got it dramatically wrong regarding their strategy, don't survive. So after 170 years, not that I'll be here in 170 years, I think we're pretty good at analyzing market situations and conditions and really trying to formulate and unpick very complex environments, which the UK electrical industry is, and how we move forward on that. And that then dictates and prioritizes how we as an organization and a corporation focus our investments and our efforts in the market. So I'm not going to go back over 60 odd years of the electrical uh, uh, industry in the UK, only to say that just in the post-war years, so back as, as early as 1947, the UK government started to really started to centralize. And you can imagine today, if we had 625 electricity companies in the UK, and we all today talk about the big six, actually the six really large DNOs, retailers, and one TSO in National Grid, if you ignore Scotland with uh, SSE and, and Scottish Power. So a real rationalization in the industry over the years, and I've just pulled out some highlights. And in the late 80s, 90s, although we had the first um, peak, off-peak tariffing with Economy 7, so these are in-feed tariffs uh, that were even thought of as early as, as the late 70s. You look at the Electricity Planning Act uh, in the late 80s, 90s, and, and it was really the start of the privatization of the industry. And you'll know today, uh, or you may know today, that most of our electrical infrastructure is either owned by Germans, uh, Italians, Spanish, uh, and more recently, just the Chinese looking to maybe do some infrastructure investments. So a very, very internationalized uh, industry today, privatized industry. Um, and then just recently, following the electricity market reform, uh, the Royal Ascent as early as 2013, which really try and sets the agenda for the coming decades of how this industry uh, will behave, look, and, uh, and feel to those investors going forward. Just looking at a schematic that we, we use uh, often within the company, but this basically is, um, and I deliberately put smart transmission because our transmission operators globally, and, and I know National Grid feel the same. Um, actually, if, if we talk about smart grids, does that mean that today's infrastructure isn't smart? I absolutely, it is smart. If I tell you that over 85% of this transmission network is absolutely visible real time to the network operator, voltage quality, uh, stabilization, checking on harmonics, looking at load, it's a very sophisticated infrastructure. When you come further down the chain, I would agree. And so later on, I'll just talk about smart distribution because really smart grid is about the distribution layers, not the transmission, the, the, the very high voltage transmission layers. So smart transmission has been around for a long time. And in fact, a lot of our history, you've seen on my title slide, I've got the pleasure of being head of smart grid. Prior to that, I was head of energy automation. And energy automation is all about automating and making this an intelligent grid. And I know people get annoyed with the, with the, the use of the word smart grid. You know, we, we started to use intelligent grids now. Transmission grids have been highly intelligent for many, many years. 
Um, you will recognize this um, picture. Uh, these, these blots, carbuncles on the landscape, as, uh, as uh, someone once commented. But basically, the energy flow was that um, um, supply followed demand. So we basically put in large, um, and you'll see on the later chart, really big, powerful coal-fired power plants. In fact, 100% fire, uh, fired by coal. And that simply flowed down into step-up transformers into the high-voltage networks to then take it to the towns and cities where the demand uh, was needed from that supply. So a very linear unilateral flow of energy. And when you look at that energy mix from the 50s to 2010, you'll see this dominance back here of, of coal. Then we, we started to put in oil-fired power plants, and then you see the emergence in the 60s of uh, nuclear. And then much later, in the 80s, gas coming on stream. And then these other uh, uh, technologies, generation technologies, wind, solar, uh, ground heat pumps, a whole series of other generation, biomass, uh, waste to energy plant. So that's been the picture for the past 60 years. When you look at that, uh, what, what has that 60 years created? Actually, one of the most advanced, sophisticated, and reliable networks in the world. Um, I know from my international travels that National Grid is actually revered as a very competent and capable transmission operator. So our American colleagues, our Chinese colleagues, our Indian colleagues look to National Grid and the reason being, if you look at some of these statistics, so these outages are, are mainly planned outages uh, where they have to do maintenance on the, on the transmission grid. Um, there are some failings, of course, there are, but that's still a very, very high percentage uptime. And then when you look at the, when it's up just below 95% of the time, it's almost four nines reliability. Now, Hong Kong claim that they have 99999 uh, so they're actually claiming uh, a couple of fourth digit percentages, Six Sigma just slightly higher than the national grid. But the key message is, it's an unbelievably very reliable, very stable network. And I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands um, because of all the storms and recent outages from the distribution network. But if I'd have asked that question five years ago, very few people in this audience would have put their hand up. The UK has enjoyed over the last 60 years a very stable, very reliable, very cost-effective um, supply of electricity. Key point, looking at that uh, rear view mirror and looking back. Um, so a very linear flow, big power stations, mainly coal-fired, recently gas coming on, nuclear coming on. And, and uh, I hope the MSc students don't take offense at this. Um, but really, a very simple flow from source generation down some piping to where supply was needed. And I'll show uh, development of this as we go through the, the discussion. So a very simple flow, although we shouldn't underestimate those that are in this industry will take great offense to think that this is an intelligent grid today. Unfortunately, someone's been playing with the plumbing uh, and we now have distributed generation. We have onshore, offshore wind farms. We have solar. We have ground heat pumps. Um, because of that intermittency, we have to put some form of storage in. So we're all experimenting with, uh, with battery storage and other forms of, of storing this intermittency from our energy generation system. So the, the network, and not just in the UK, but globally, is becoming far more complex. And our image as a corporation is this one now. So you still have this very linear transmission flow, but we have to be cognizant of microgrids, electrification of rail, e-vehicles, um, as I mentioned before, ground heat pumps, solar, uh, and the fact that this isn't a, 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 an underlying core reliable uh, source of energy. When the wind doesn't blow or it's nighttime, solar panels aren't working and the turbines aren't generating. So we need to find a way of balancing the networks of the future. If I tell you in Germany, where there's a really high drive now because of the commitment to decarbonize and uh, decommission their coal-fired plants, and recently, which wiped off billions of the ba uh, balance sheet values of the German energy companies, 
uh, a real determination to, uh, to stop nuclear generation. So a real big drive, and I'll show some stats later, on, uh, on renewable energy. They're already on the edge of blackouts um, where they're getting freak storms. Either the wind's too fast, so they have to switch the turbines off, or it's too slow, and they've got anti-cyclonic -cy uh, weather conditions, and it's just not generating enough power. And we'll talk a little bit about that as I go through. So a far more complex environment looking, looking forward. So if we look at the future, and this is the core of the government agenda, reducing the UK's greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. But if you look at some of the surrounding information, top left, my old industry, no internal combustion engines by 2050. Everything electric or hydro or some other form of, of energy uh, to drive those vehicles. Um, smart meter rollout we all know about by 2019. Um, 15% renewable energy by 2020, 30 gigawatts of wind power by 2030, 30 gigawatts. Today we have four gigawatts. Um, we have an installed capacity in the UK of about 84, 85 gigawatts of, of maximum power. So this is a significant percentage. And if you think that that's then an intermittent um, uh, source, we really have a big challenge on, on how we balance that, that network. Uh, to the right, you'll see that uh, 3,000 kilometres of additional electrified railway by 2019, again, put more load, and more burden on the energy infrastructure as we decarbonise the rail industry. Um, we've talked, or I've talked about reducing EU's greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030, 80% by 2050. And then this storage challenge, 3 gigawatts of, watts of energy storage in the network today, 9 gigawatts by 2020 and 27 gigawatts to balance some of this renewable agenda on the left-hand side of the chart by 2050. Um, and so you'll read in the press that the UK government talk about a £110 billion pound investment over this period, £110 billion. And I know it was Dr Golby of E.ON, the former chairman, who coined the phrase, and it's actually in the ERM report, that's the equivalent of building 20 Olympic stadiums every year for the next 20 years. 20 Olympic stadiums. Where are the engineers, where are the construction companies, where are the resources going to come from to build 20 Olympic stadiums every year in the UK? It's a massive undertaking. Massive undertaking. Fantastic for everyone in the room because this is a great career opportunity for all of us, for the entrepreneurs and the people looking forward <laughs> To, to really crack in how we, how we accomplish these, these very stretching goals. Looking at the energy mix going forward, this is all public information, but uh, obviously we use this as, as we're looking to where we need to invest. Coal still dominates. Um, you'll see slowly declining off. Um, we see oil completely disappearing. Gas continues. Nuclear continues. As you know that the government have committed they're looking at uh, several new fleets of nuclear power. And um, the emergence of increased wind, and there's a whole dilemma, and this is about strategy again. We have a range that there'll be a minimum of 8 gigawatts, uh, a maximum of 30 to 40 gigawatts, but no more. So you can then scenario that. If it's 8 gigawatts, what does the energy infrastructure look like? If it's 40 gigawatts, what does it have to look like? And that's how we, obviously, derive our plans <laughs> for what the challenges will be in this sector. Uh, and we can do that in the UK, or we can do it in Germany, or we can do it in the United States, wherever we are. Um, and then a whole series, and you'll see that there's still imports there. And there's a whole dialogue about the super grid. So these imports don't necessarily mean the gas imports. This could be taking wind power from Denmark, or shipping wind power from Scotland down to England, or from England to Belgium. So this again is maybe taking an agenda that balances the network across Europe, um, not just the UK being a, a, an isolated island. And recently we've had the great pleasure of connecting um, uh, the Netherlands with the UK island. Siemens actually produced the, uh, the interconnection between Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. So the interconnections are already happening. So these are very high voltage, 600 kilovolts and above, interconnections between countries. 
And this again, this super grid agenda, is about how we can maybe balance the network across the continent without having to put expensive uh, storage in, storage solutions like batteries and so on. So, we, and you'll have read um, those that are focused on this subject about the energy trilemma, we absolutely under, underpin this and believe that this is absolutely right. It's about keeping this in equilibrium. It's about security of supply. If we go back a decade when the uh, Ukraine uh, threatened to switch off the gas, I think it really brought it home to the UK government that actually we're chronically dependent on international imports. And as a major first world nation, can we really have that going forward regarding our industry and the effect it would have on our economy? So security of supply has really become a big issue for the government. How are we self-sufficient going forward as a nation? And how could we possibly be a net exporter of energy? Um, sustainability, the 80% carbon reduction by 2050, it's on the agenda, we can't ignore it. It's not about if greenhouse gases are affecting the environment, it's about by how much. You know, estimates of 2%, uh, sorry, 2 degrees, 4 degrees. We've seen estimates of even 6 or 8 degrees. That has significant impact. If, if we see a 4 degree increase in global average temperatures in the cities, that could be an 8 or 9% increase. Um, but all of that needs to be done at a sensible cost. And I want to just share some, some stats around the cost subject. So... If we, just, if we just took an economic efficiency, um, and this is why this triangle works for us, if we just looked at this, and we just purely looked at cost and we ignored environmental impact and security of supply, we would put in coal-fired power plant, very predictable energy sources, cheap gas, followed by gas and nuclear, which has some uh, ability and, and will certainly fix the security of supply issue anyway, because it gives us the capacity we need going out into the future. It doesn't do much for the green economy and, car and decarbonisation of the networks. Um, and as you move down this um, vector and you put more and more renewables and sustainable energies in, I'll give you a, uh, an example. I'm not sure whether this is a, an adage that's used, but in Siemens we talk about beat, beat coal because the generation cost of one terawatt or one gigawatt or one megawatt of power coming from a wind farm is three times as costly as that coming out of a coal-fired power plant. Three times. And so we have an agenda in Siemens called Beat Coal. How do we get generation from wind cheaper than a coal-fired power plant? And as you come along this, this vector, it becomes more and more uneconomical to, in today's terms. Um, because we haven't got the technologies and we haven't got the ability to get wind below that price point. It also brings in complexities around intermittency um, because you can't get this predictable load. The transmission operators call about a dispatchable load. A coal-fired power plant, is very, unless it has a, a chronic failure, which, which are rare, it's a very predictable dispatchable load. Uh, when it comes to wind, if the wind's not blowing, we can't predict that. Weather forecasts now and a whole ton of new entrepreneurs are starting up about getting more accuracy in weather predictions. If the sun doesn't shine, we don't get any output from solar. And I'll show some output efficiencies of some of these installed generation in a, in a slide, which I'm coming up to. Just quickly talk cost. I took a, uh, a sheet of European um, countries to just look at the relative mix of energy cost. And if you'll see Copenhagen here, a very high burden, very dominated by renewable energy, a very green country. They've got a 35% burden because of that. So every pound spent, 35 pence goes on supporting their renewable industry. If you look in Germany, which I talked about, 29%, and I'll, I'll come on to Germany as a major powerhouse, a manufacturing powerhouse in Europe. You look at London, 11% uh, and of that 11% to my knowledge 4% is on renewables the other 7% is on retrofitting and energy efficiency so it's not just about generation of energy and, and our sources it's about what we do with that energy so we've got old leaky Victorian buildings uh, 
you know, poor insulation in our homes. If you compare that with Copenhagen, who spend you know, triple glazing, has, has been there in their designs and their building standards for decades. So we're catching up with our building standards and um, uh, you know, our environmental or, or the use of, of energy as a, as, a, as a subject. If you look at the cost of that, because it's all right looking at percentages of every pound we spend, uh, you'll see that actually the UK, amongst our European colleagues, is very cost efficient. So if we think we've got problems with the cost of energy today, look at some of our European counterparts. And you'll see uh, Copenhagen actually, are probably about median, and they're working tirelessly to get that cost and efficiency of their networks down. Uh, but look at Berlin. And there's massive public outcries in Berlin today, or Germany as a, as a nation. Um, so this is cents per euro per kilowatt hour, and this is January 24, so this is most recent information. Just about 33 cents per kilowatt hour, compared to about 18, pence, uh, 18 cents sorry, in the UK. But if you take industry, uh, because this is what I wanted to just draw some, some parallel to, UK at 8.5, now these are heavily subsidised, I want to bring out a little provocative uh, position here. Um, you look at Germany, um, 9.4, very close to the UK, but just in the Times today, I read on a train on the way down, 15 billion of subsidies by the German government into industry. In other words, the German economy would have been 15 billion uh, more costly in its exports than it is today because it's been heavily subsidized by others within Germany. Taxpayers, residential consumers, and small and medium enterprise, not the big industrial giants. Siemens amongst them, I've got to say. BASF, one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, one of their core commodities is energy. They will become uncompetitive on a global basis if energy continues to rise. The US is not a European country, but I just threw it in there as a comparator. While, in, while the US talk a fantastic job on green economies, they are absolutely paranoid about the cost of energy. And look, they've got one of the lowest costs. I didn't have time to look at China and India, but I would imagine they're not dissimilar. This is about cost efficiency of their industries and how do we protect them. And so as you come down the vector from sustainable uh, sorry, from, from coal, nuclear, and gas, and move to that renewable agenda, you start to significantly increase your generation costs. And we have to consider that. Absolutely have to consider it. I just put in gas prices as well, just as a comparator. And you'll see again, the UK are doing quite well amongst our European colleagues, but we're three times more expensive than the United States. So anyone who's got a gas-intensive industry if their raw commodity, and, and, and if you look, you know, the breakdown might be 30%, 35% of their core commodity is, is energy, a smelting plant or a paper mill, or, you know, that's th three times more expensive for every, for every terawatt they use than their competitors. If it was about security of supply, um, I mentioned before, we'd be putting in coal, nuclear, more gas. Um, and we would be keeping a sensible balance on intermittency generation like solar, wind, uh, and so on. National Grid, you'll have read in the press recently, or may have read, that they talked about we're in 4% of blackouts. They are predicting by 2015 we will be in 2.5% of peak load blackouts in the UK. Unprecedented for decades. So there's a real concern about this shift away from coal-fired to other forms of, of energy generation. I just wanted to share with you the output efficiencies of, of several generation plant for, for interest. So if you look at our gas turbines, uh, and this is actually, um, uh, Siemens produce some of the world's most efficient gas turbines, but the output efficiency is about 62%. Nuclear, 60%, although the Americans, who run it far more consistently than we do in the UK, actually get out 90% efficiency from their nuclear power plants. It's much higher percentage of their base load in, in the States. Coal, 42%, but very cheap commodity, burning coal. But the process itself is very inefficient, 42%. Mm -hmm. 
Then if you look at hydro, wind, 27%, but look at solar, 8%. Um, you, you may have read in the press, but Siemens divested of its solar business recently because we don't think solar at those efficiency levels will be a dominant uh, mix of, of energy. Maybe in localized microgrid systems, but not on a national basis. I took this as well. This is a great example. This comes from uh, a study by uh, Poiri in July 2012. And what the, the study did was they took a weather, uh, actual weather conditions from January 2000, UK conditions, when there was anticyclonic uh, weather conditions from the 19th to something like the 23rd of January. And they mapped that onto a scenario that said, if we were 40 gigawatts of wind power in the UK, what would have happened with the network? And you can see what, a couple of things that happened. Is the wind output generation and by the way, just following that, they had a massive uh, um, upside where wind generation was at its most efficient for a series of days as well. So they, they really went trough and peak over the space of about seven days. Think about the network operators trying to balance that as a challenge. But what, look what happened to the price. Uh, the price uh, point went to the roof as National Grid uh, tried to sustain energy usage. And actually, we're paying big industrial giants to, uh, to actually switch off their load. Um, but this scenario would just show you what, what happens in these uh, situations. And what then, if you look at nuclear, gas, uh, coal, how that... So if, if we go to a, a very high percentage of, of renewables, we're going to have to have some backup reserve. Either spinning reserve, which is very expensive, which is what we do today, actually, if this ever occurs... Um, or we'll have to find a way of, of storing energy from these intermittent energy generation sources, and that's very expensive battery storage. And if we give you a, a, a commercialised price today, for every megawatt of battery storage, it costs about a million euros. It's just too expensive to put very high-volume batteries in, um, into, the, into the network. And in fact, in Spain... We've been working on a project for voltage stabilization, not for, not for energy backup. It's to stabilize the voltage on the network. And we think applications like that could be successful. If it's about sustainability, you would obviously drive to the green agenda um, and put in, obviously, um, carbon capture, which, again, is, is very expensive today. So maybe capturing carbon from... Uh, from coal and gas-fired output plants today. Um, but sustainability is also, as I said before, it's not just about the generation and the electricity network. It's about behavior. It's about efficiency of use. So there's a massive agenda about how we use energy as well, all of us, industry and, and consumers. And so naturally, in our opinion, it's, it's about keeping this in equilibrium. It's about keeping our agenda on greenhouse gas reductions in focus. Absolutely, we all know and we're all committed to do that. Some of the technologies don't enable us to do that today. Some do, but it's at a cost. And we have to keep that cost then of looking at our European counterparts and competitors uh, in, in focus as well. Because it's about UK PLC then as being a, a manufacturing nation um, and looking at its percentage of GDP as we try to drive up manufacturing in this, this country. Um, and it's also obviously addressing the security of part, uh, supply issue that in the future, hopefully, we become a net exporter of energy from the UK shores. I just pulled this out. This is last Friday. This is the Chancellor. I think he's absolutely not. Uh, this, is, this is agnostic politics. This is the fact that I think this guy has actually got it spot on. Just look at what he said, or, or, or was quoted as saying. I want to provide the, for the country the cheapest energy possible, consistent with having it reliable, in other words, as a steady supply, and consistent with us playing our part in an international effort to tackle climate change. What he's saying there, in, in our opinion, is that we can't just go alone. We will absolutely make our economy uncompetitive, and we'll demise as a manufacturing nation. This is about the G20. 
and about China and India and the United States of America and the rest of the EU all taking and carrying an equal burden. It's no good the UK uh, or Copenhagen being totally dependent on renewable wind energy and not being able to manufacture anything because they're too expensive and collapsing as a nation. It's about keeping that balance. And, and I can assure you from all the evidence we see in the States, because we are out there trying to sell wind turbines, um, there is no take up. They are absolutely focused on the cost of their energy. From, from our perspective, we think there's six key challenges in the industry. And this is what we're focused on. Um, and this is global. This is not just the UK. This, this transports very well around the world. It's about balancing. If we're going to have this energy mix, nuclear, gas, coal, um, renewables, solar, uh, wind, and so on, we have to find a way of balancing that network. As we electrify our rail networks, as we bring on more electric vehicles, as we have more interconnected assets around the network that we can switch load from building A to building B and so on. So that balancing has to become more intuitive and more real time and less human intervention. So balancing and systems around balancing is absolutely key to the solutions. Peak avoidance, this is peak shaving. So taking the 84 gigawatts that we have installed capacity today and making sure we never approach that, the fact that we can shave, we can peak load. So this is all about demand response. It's about shifting load from, you know, generation plant, or sorry, from um, process plant A to B and so on, and shifting and finding ways of behavioral change in the network. It's about resilience. It's about keeping the 0.49s reliability because it will have major effect on our lives and hospitals and industry if we didn't have a 4.9s reliable infrastructure. Of course, it's about CO2. Um, and, and decarbonisation of the networks and becoming more efficient and more, uh, more uh, caring about the way we use and consume energy. And I, 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 I quote a major, uh, at the CEO of a major utility um, a, a year or so back, very, very provocative statement when he said, one of the problems we have as an industry is that energy is too cheap. And it's not at the forefront of everyone's mind because, you know, our bills come in you know, 50, 100 pound a month. Um, it's not as, as, uh, as, as forward, you know, in our daily lives as it should be. It's becoming more that case now, but historically it hasn't been. And it's about, obviously, to do that, we have to be careful of the cost. So it's about shifting and becoming more, uh, more efficient with the generation systems that we use. So just quickly a little bit on the Siemens bit, we've gone from a 1.5 megawatt turbine to 3.5 megawatt turbine, and in the UK Isles, we've installed the first ever global 6 megawatt turbine, which will uh, keep about 1,500 homes um, with free energy. Um, so these systems are getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we go. Theft avoidance. Um, I would have said some years ago that actually Theft's not a big issue in the UK. I can tell you in some states around the world, theft is over 70% of generated energy. 70%. In the UK, the ENA, the uh, Energy Networks Association, were just recently quoted as saying that over half a billion of theft is occurring every year in the UK. To every bill payer in the audience, that's about £30 per head. £30 is just being stolen from our networks. So it's all about, because the, old, the other thing we believe as well in the, in the top diagram is that as we put in more generation sources, micro generation, solar and so on, there will be more abilities for people to tap into the network and do fraudulent things. So this is about cyber security, it's about network security and so on. So that's a big agenda in our opinion. And then decentralized optimization, micro generation. We absolutely believe that cities will become ESCOs, i.e. they will become generators and controllers of, of energy networks themselves. Uh, and we've got evidence of that in London, Glasgow, Manchester, um, where they actually will stop buying from the big utility companies and start creating their own energy companies and serving their own cities. So this decentral optimization is absolutely key because there will be times when they have to tap into the national network still. 
So there has to be a, a trading process. Um, and so they're the, the six challenges that, that we see and we're focused on today. Hopefully that gave you some insight into our perspective. Uh, whether we've got this right or wrong will determine whether we're here for the next two decades or more. Uh, if we've got it sadly wrong, we'll probably be acquired by one of our competitors. Thank you. My question is, there are so many challenges, so many problems, so this means you need some kind of uh, integrated strategy. Yep. So that you can combine with, let's say, green and also with renewable energy. That does not make sense. Yep. Now, uh, the question is, I think all these problems come because we do not know yet this, this knowledge-based activities of what, where the energy is, how the energy flows, Etc. Et now, because now they are moving new technology, page on IP, I talk about smart city using, for example, big data now. Yeah. That's can manage and can solve if you take in an internet way all this problem that you mentioned on uh, as on your yeah. talk. So my question is, what is your let's say uh, aspect of this new yeah. approach and the way of moving more yeah. towards this? Yeah. yeah, thank you. If, if I give an example to that, so um, we talk about connected assets. So, so today, if we look in this building, I am convinced there will be a building management system controlling the air temperature, uh, possibly the lighting and so on. It actually is in isolation. It's probably not talking to the next building. Uh, so the campus for London Imperial is actually a series of disparate buildings that don't talk to each other. So an example of that would be to get the whole infrastructure here connected. Um, if, we, if we drop the temperature in this room by one degree or so, you wouldn't notice. So we can, we can trim the air conditioning for an hour. If I take an example of Tesco's, a big retailer, massive refrigeration, we can trim their, we can switch their fridges off for four hours. Um, and it's empirically proven, you know, the, 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 the fridge, decay time with it and so on. So there are ways and means that this, this is not technically insolvable. It's about will and it's about desire. Um, so, so those examples would, would create a smart city. So if we had London, and if you take, take all the hotels in London and just look at the, the energy requirements around the city, if we interconnected all those buildings in a smart system, which exists, and this is big data, uh, and we real-time monitored the energy consumption of those buildings, and we had to trim half a megawatt because there's a load. Um, you know, the wind turbines aren't blowing. We could trim that um, as controllable load, and we'll switch off all the air conditioning in those hotels. We can't switch the lights off, obviously, but we can trim the air conditioning, which is a massive source of energy consumption. In the winter, we'll trim the, the heating. So there's a, just a simple example. But that would take a series of different landowners, different landlords, sorry, who own all these hotels with no real appetite. Uh, that was a, a bit too much of a generalization. Some of the hotels we talk to are absolutely on to the green agenda and want their brand to be associated with, with sustainability. Some don't. It's all about return on shareholder investment. But if you could connect all those hotels or all this campus together, we would start to have a microgrid started. Technically, it's more than doable. And we've got examples around the world where we're involved in, where we're interconnecting assets. Uh, and it's about controlling those assets then. Um, taking on a city like London then is, is, a, is a massive challenge, but doable, technically doable. Um, a lot of companies today um, are, you know, for example, IKEA and Microsoft are um, investing in, in separate um, sort of grid projects um, where they, they hope to get their energy sources from there or, or you know, through RECs. Um, how does that play into your six challenges, into that balance, into the decentralization and so forth? Is this, is this, do you see this as a trend in the US and, and the rest of the world where companies invest in these projects? And how does this yeah. fit with the national grid? My, my take on that is that uh, and, and Google have, uh, have been trying with the Google meter and so on that they brought out some years ago, which has sort of fell away. Microsoft, Google and Microsoft as brands and as corporations, um, from, from my uh, you know, perception, uh, know that this is a massive agenda going forward and they can't ignore it. 
So, so the ability to, to integrate and present. So, so in your home, you know, we talk about home displays. Uh, in America now, they're actually installing um, uh, home displays in the, in the televisions. So LG, for instance, have an installed circuit board that when the baseball's finished or it's, it's quarter time, they switch the green button and the house comes up and they can look at the shower and the, the energy consumption. So, so different models, and I think that's where Google, Microsoft and so on see, actually, we need to be in this space because this is about information. This is about presentment. This is about GUI interfaces and, and, and making it more accessible to, to, you know, this is about information flow. And if you talk to those brands, you're talking about information and the use of information. And that's why, for us, uh, and, and I can tell you not, not to, um, that we've had many conversations with these brands about uh, home automation, uh, ho home hubs, uh, how we get this data back from the, um, you know, from, the, from the consumer. I'll give you another example. When I showed um, smart meters, one of the first justifications for smart meters was that we could do far more presentment in the home. We could improve, and one of the big uh, stacks in the, in the uh, business case is outage management. I'll give you a, a different example. You don't need a smart meter in every home for outage management. Just look at how many routers are installed. We just send an IP signal to the router and say, have you got power? We don't need a smart meter to tell us whether there's power on in a home or in a building. We'll just, we'll just talk to one of the routers. If the router's not communicating with us, we'll talk to the next router. If that's not talking to us, the building's probably out. So, so you can see how, how five years ago we were talking smart meters will be great for brownfield and, and, and outages. Because today, in the distribution network, there's only, I'm not sure whether I mentioned this, there's only about 35% visible. The way utilities respond to outages is, is the call center. You as a consumer pick the phone up and say, I've got no power. And they send a van out, a man in a van. That's how crude it is today. So, so the, sorry, the Google and Microsoft absolutely front of their mind because they will absolutely not be around in five years if they don't grab this uh, user intimacy and interface to, to the consumer. Uh, hi, Matthew Aylott from the UK Energy Research Centre. We uh, uh, produced a report this week on, on smart grids and today uh, the Smart Grids um, Forum have released their route map for the future. And both we and uh, the Smart Grid Forum both said one of the key issues uh, going forward, particularly if you look at deck scenarios for, for 2030, 2050, is the huge increase in, in uh, demand for electricity yeah. and how we manage that. And it's going to involve a lot of uh, public interplay, a lot of demand side management. And how do you get the public on board? For example, if you are automating devices or if you're trying to encourage them to use their electric vehicles as batteries um, uh, and charge them overnight, selectively charging them at one point rather than another, so how do you engage the consumers and get them on board? Because that seems really important. Yeah. If I knew the answer to that, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be standing here this evening. <laughs> this is a really difficult... You, you, will get, you will get a typical distribution. You'll get the 5% that absolutely are passionate about conservation. <coughs> and you'll get a whole rump of people that actually, it's not front of mind, I'm not sure how it works, I'm not sure... You know, me switching off a light in the bedroom is not going to save the planet and you've got the guys in the six cylinder you know uh, sorry six liter 12 cylinder you know sports cars to say have you seen the americans and what they drive i mean so so this is a massive massive challenge and you've got the other extreme with the absolute cynics that still you know don't think that the polar caps are, are melting so i uh, you know, there's examples. We, um, we, we did a, a major installation in New Zealand and, uh, in, in smart meters and trying to bring that, and it's a relatively small country, 1.4 million inhabitants. You know, how do you bring, because that's like a, a large, it's, it's not even a large city in the UK. How do you bring the whole community along? And, and that's a long journey. That's a long journey about, you know, marketing about the environment, the effect it's having efficiency of, of what they're consuming and so on. But and whose responsibility is it? Siemens, the government? All. All, isn't it? Because we're enablers. The government set the policy in the environment. 
innovation or innovative companies like Siemens bring the technology and the solutions, and then it's about consumer take-ups. Yeah, the possible solution to go back to the idea of off peak charge, so that the tariff is um, very clear, so that a time's going to warm up your hot water or charge your car battery, you know when to do it, or to do the yeah. washing overnight and stuff like that. Yeah. So people are really hard up will just manage this. When, yeah. when the tariff is the lowest. I, I absolutely agree. And, um, and feed-in tariffs and time-of-use tariffing, which is very prominent in the States today, is, uh, is definitely a breakthrough. And if you look at some of the DSOs in the UK, they're already um, uh, experimenting with time-of-use tariffing. Uh, in the low-carbon network uh, project, which I'm a, a member of, um, we're absolutely sending uh, uh, peak-time tariff messages and also talk about Google and Microsoft. You know, on your handy, you send a message to say uh, energy is at a, a negative price because we've got too much energy capacity coming out from this intermittency. So we want you to, to switch on load. Uh, and we'll actually give you a reduction for that, which happened to National Grid not so long back to avoid a, 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 an outage. So, so there are negative price waves that could be sent out to, to certain communities to say, Switch your heating on now, get, you know, get your, your, your uh, immersion heater up on full, you know, three kilowatt load and get your tanks. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely believe that time of use tariffing, peak shaving, this would be one of the ways. And, and also then, as they did in the telecommunications industry, make it very onerous between the hours of 11 and 2 o'clock in the afternoon when we have peak load in the UK, make it very expensive for people to use power. Um, Unfortunately, I've got to say, my wife's an anarchist because she, if she wants to put the dishwasher on, she will put it on when she's loaded it. No matter how many times I tell her that that's the most expensive time. You know, put it on after one o'clock in the morning. All the dishwashers today, well, not all, certainly ours do, they're AAA rated and they have, they have timers on them. 